Thank you. Can everybody still hear me? Yep. Okay, so just a quick overview. Um, essentially, I'm going to give you probably the most detailed look into Hello World you've probably had since you first wrote Hello World. Um, I'm effectively looking at uh, how, you, how you would write a, a very, very basic compiler that compiles down to JVM bytecode and runs on the JVM. Okay, so as the slide says, I'm a senior consultant for uh, Shine Technologies. Um, we've got offices in Melbourne and Brisbane. Uh, we've just recently opened a Brisbane office. Um, me personally, I'm a hobbyist compiler enthusiast. I don't actually work with compilers in the field. Um, it's just something that I do for kicks. Uh, my first real exposure to compilers was probably the, the C Python uh, code base where I was sort of responsible for implementing the try accept finally syntax. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it, for those of you who aren't too familiar with Python, up until Python 2.5, you could only do try accept or try finally. You couldn't actually use both in the, in the same try suite. So you had to nest them, and it was just really nasty, and it really irritated me, so that was heaps of fun. Um, then in 2.6, uh, it sounds really, really scary. A uh, compilation of ASTs within Python. Um, so essentially, uh, an abstract syntax tree is like a, an in-memory logical representation of a, of a program. Um, you basically take source code, run it through a scanner and parser, and you get an AST at the end. That sort of represents your program. And basically, implemented code that could compile ASTs down into Python bytecode. So blah, 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 blah. Essentially, all of my background, as far as compilers are concerned, is with Python. So I'm here talking about the JVM. Um, and the reason for that is essentially just for kicks. Um, as I said, I'm, a, I'm an enthusiast. I you know, enjoy playing around with these different things. Um, so I guess if you're going to write a compiler that targets a JVM, you, you sort of have to wonder, well, why would I do that? I mean, isn't, isn't Java slow? And, Java's not really slow, you know. It's, it's start of time leaves a little bit to be desired. Um, it's probably my biggest issue with the JVM. Um, but long running processes, it's pretty highly optimized. Um, I mean, the stuff I'm going to show you today is probably not going to be a long running process. Um, but still, it should give you some idea of, of how you'd go about doing this stuff. Uh, I mentioned memory management here. Uh, it's really, really nice when you're working with compilers not to have to worry about uh, memory management in general. Um, writing compilers in C it can be a little bit uh, hairy in that regard. Uh, and the JVM is enterprise friendly. It means you can compile to class files and deploy it to JVM friendly enterprises and they're not going to complain about it. Um, just recently we've had to deploy some PHP stuff and we had to jump through a few hoops just to make that happen. Um, so, you know, JVM, that sort of stuff doesn't sort of become an issue too often, unless you're in a Microsoft shop. Okay, so Compiler Construction 101. Um, this, is, this is sort of a generalized compiler architecture. Um, not every compiler you look at will follow this exact structure, but it'll be some slight variation of it generally speaking. Um, so you've got a scanner which takes your source code, which might be you know, Java or C++ or whatever, uh, converts it into tokens, so it identifies words within the source code stream. You know, uh, oh, that's an if keyword, that's a bracket, that's a string, that sort of thing. Uh, and then that stream of tokens is fed into a parser, and the parser takes that stream of tokens and effectively structures it and the way it structures it tends to be into a, a tree sort of form. So in my particular case, I'm going to use an abstract syntax tree. But back in the day, they used to also use a thing called a parse tree, which was sort of more at the, at the grammar level than the logic level, which is what the AST is, is sort of more targeting. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, 
Then the AST is passed into a code generator, which generates your target code. And the cool thing about uh, the AST is that it's sort of language and, well, source language and target language neutral. So you can effectively take uh, the AST and write a JVM code generator and then write a .NET code generator or, you know, whatever you can think of, JavaScript, whatever. Um, which is sort of the, the power of uh, the AST. Okay, so hello world. Can everybody understand this program? Could you explain it for me? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so hopefully that's, that's pretty straightforward. But what I want to do is sort of break this down in terms of how a compiler, well, how a scanner and a, uh, and a parser would look at this. So, Effectively, a scanner would go through and say, oh, okay, well, we've got this uh, identifier or keyword here, um, followed by a bracket, followed by a string, followed by another bracket, followed by a semicolon. Um, and that's essentially the, the tokens that sort of get fed into uh, the parser. So if we take that up another level, we can express a put s statement as the put s keyword, I guess you could call it, followed by a bracket, followed by a string, followed by another bracket, followed by a semicolon, Whereas a, where a string is defined as the regular expression that starts with a quote, has anything that isn't a quote in between it, and ends with a quote. Um, obviously, you can't escape strings in this particular compiler, but, well, escape quotes, but anyway. So, I mean, that's, that's all well and good, but, you know, if we wanted to make this parser a little bit more useful, uh, a little bit more general, we could take the put s statement and turn it into a put s function call. So all of a sudden that put s bracket blah is just a, a function call to a function called put s. So we say, okay, well, a call consists of a name, which is an ID which matches a regu that regular expression down there, which looks really scary, but it effectively starts with any alphabetical character or an underscore followed by any alphabetical character or an underscore or numbers. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, obviously not Unicode friendly, but you know. Um, so, okay, our, our function can take a string. We could probably take that a step further and say, okay, well, the call takes any number of arguments, which can be any type of expression. And an expression can be a string or a call, uh, or a name, technically, as well, would probably work. Um, and then up the top, I've just defined a statement. So we say, um, because, because we've defined an expression as potentially being a call, we don't want to have to put a semicolon at the end of, of every call that we make. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so, you know, you start out with these, these really simple sort of grammars and you, and you build on them and, and, and expand upon them and, and you generalize them and all of a sudden you've, you've got a, a much more expressive sort of language uh, uh, that, you can, that you can easily go and implement. And the way that you can, you can implement this stuff uh, at the scanner and parser level anyway, is using Scala's pass combinators, which are effectively a DSL for describing passes in Scala. Um, so you can sort of say, I expect this token, I expect, uh, I expect the if keyword followed by a bracket, followed by an expression, um, and then based on those pass results, you can construct an AST or you can execute an action like, you can actually evaluate programs as you go along um, if you're if you're feeling masochistic, um, and yeah, AST abstract syntax tree. So uh, Scala's parser combinators look like this um, down the bottom. So you've got a grammar, an expression is a string or a function call, and down the bottom, it's more or less identical to to the grammar. Uh, back up the top again, you've again got 
uh, a call is a name followed by a bracket, followed by args, followed by another bracket, followed by a semicolon. And again, down the bottom, um, you'll see uh, the, the little tilde. Uh, that's, that's effectively combining the, the tokens as you go along. So you're, you're sort of saying, OK, well, this is a name followed by something else. Then up there, you'll see there's, there's a tilde, and, and they look like little arrows pointing in towards the arcs. And that's effectively saying, ignore everything to the left, ignore everything to the right. We just want the, the stuff in the middle. Um, and that's kind of grouped by the brackets around the quoted brackets so that you don't discard the name that you originally passed. So that's effectively saying name followed by args. Hopefully that sort of makes sense. <laughs> OK, so with the past combinators sort of briefly discussed, I'll, I'll run through a, a quick proof of concept at the end so that you can actually see what this stuff looks like altogether. Uh, hello world in AST form for our simple little language. Looks something like that. Uh, so we've got a call. A call has a name, which in our case is put us, and a list of arguments, which is the string literal, literal, <laughs> string literal hello world. You could also take that a step further and say, well, a program actually consists of a list of statements. Um, and in this particular case, our program consists of one statement. Um, I'm not going to go into that sort of detail because I probably don't have time. Um, and I certainly didn't have the time to write the code to go and do that. I wrote this last night, so apologies. <laughs> Um, so all our, all our programs in this little demo will just be using a single statement, a single expression. So how do we represent ASTs in Scala? Uh, what I tend to use, and, and this is purely you know, my choice, it, it might make sense to do something different for whatever language you, you decide to write for the JVM, if, if you feel so inclined, um, is to use a a trait for all AST nodes, so every AST node that you can represent, those little, the, the big circles. Um, a trait for expressions and a trait for statements, just so you can differentiate between the two, and case classes for everything else. And case classes are really nice because once you've written your parser and you've constructed your AST, you can basically just call print on the resulting AST object, and it'll actually print out the AST as it looks, you know, post compilation. It's really cool stuff and just so easy. So that's what the code would actually look like for our language. I may have forgotten something. So then once you've got your AST constructed, you want to generate your JVM bytecode. And for that, I've used for this particular example a library called BCL. Uh, you effectively just generate Java bytecode equivalent to what is in your AST. Uh, in addition to that, I've also gone ahead and implemented putS using bcell so that we actually have the putS function to call. Um, because otherwise, you'd call the function putS and it doesn't exist. So. Um, the other thing that's kind of a little bit tricky with generating JVM bytecode is the verifier. Um, it will hunt you down. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to give specific examples, but you'll, you'll, get, you'll get really weird things like um, your code will compile, um, you'll generate a, a class file, uh, go to run it using Java, and it'll say uh, the stack size is too large or you know, things like that. Um, so there's a little bit of trickery that you need to do to make sure that BC, BCL generates the expected output. Okay, so that will give you just a brief look at something that I whacked together quickly last night. Oh, sure. I'll just. Can everybody read that? Yep. yep. 
All right, so as I was talking about before, um, we've got the traits, got case classes, and then back here, I'll just go back to our grammar. Okay, so down the bottom here, we've got these terminals, um, which are effectively just regular expressions. Um, you're, you're literally just reproducing those parts of the grammar in Scala code, um, and then building on that. So we've got a statement, whoops, a statement. So again, the wiggly arrow, uh, it sort of says discard everything on the right. So even though we want the um, semicolon to be there, we don't really care about the fact that it exists. Um, you'll notice that I've had to define the type of the expression method, um, and that's because it's a, it's a recursive call. So because a call can take an expression in its list of arguments, it'll actually recurse into the expression function call. Um, so we'll see that. So, okay, so we've got your list of args here. RepSep says um, zero or more of these, <laughs> zero or more of these separated by that. So zero or more expressions separated by commas, where an expression is a call or a string. Um, and at the moment, there's only one function, which is put s, um, and it's, it, it doesn't have a return value, so it doesn't really give you much to, to pass a, a function call into uh, another function call at, at this stage. It's just purely to demonstrate uh, the concept. Um, so what you actually see is once you've got the, all this stuff passed, you've got these little guys, which look like a smiley face, and you um, then effectively match against the result. So as I was saying before, you're discarding the, the bracket literals and just keeping the args. So when you actually match against that, all you need is the name and the args because everything else has been discarded. Otherwise, you'd have to do um, name followed by nothing, followed by, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, so it just cleans the code up a little bit. Um, and then obviously structuring that into a call. And this is all, you know, so because, because the, the name and args functions return name and args for you, you can just pass them into the call and so on and so forth. So name in this case will be an instance of name up here because this name method takes the regular expression, matches against it, and returns a new name object. Is that, is that sort of clear? It's, it's kind of hard to explain, but hopefully the, the code sort of demonstrates it. Anyway. And then we pass the input file. Uh, the entry point is the, the statement parser. If we get success, then we call generate, generate class with the name of the source file and the pass result, which is our statement, which, which is our call, actually. So then generate class, you wind up with all your BCEL stuff. Um, I probably don't have time to go into that right now. Um, but effectively, you just generate Java bytecode um, using built-in classes in BCL. Uh, so I'll just quickly build that. Should have built this beforehand. I'm very prepared. Okay, so oh, let's call it sample.lca. Yeah. All right, so I've written a little bash script that just calls 
that compiler class I showed you before. Sets the class path for you and all that sort of thing. And we'll dump it into program.class. Okay. And get hello world on the other end. Um, And if you dump out the bytecode, you can actually see uh, all the stuff that BCL is generating for you. Um, and using Java P is a good way to sort of figure out what you need to do if, uh, if you're not quite sure what bytecode you need to generate to implement what you need to do. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, any questions? Questions? Fantastic. How widely usable is um, the Parsec Combinator library? I know that Parsec has, or the new Parsec has quite a few edge cases with performance issues. Is, is this something you could use for something really big? Yes, um, but you need to be careful about how you write the grammars. So it's, it's a backtracking parser. Um, and there, like there are, as, as you say, there are some edge cases like in Parsec where it can go, like get into uh, a, a bit of a nasty state because it's, it's gone down you know, one massive tree and then gone, oh, I can't go any further. So it goes back up the tree and then tries you know, another massive tree. Um, and it is, it is possible to write inefficient passes, but so long as you stick to the, uh, I think it's an LLK parser or something like that, um, so long as you stick to those sorts of grammars, you shouldn't have those performance issues. You know, so it can, can handle uh, a whole bunch of different types of grammar, but if you stick to LLK, it, it sort of ensures that performance, I think. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Cool. Any more questions? Okay, fantastic. Cool. Um, everybody, please thank Tom Lee.